when I was starting out, um, I always felt like um, the way you be successful is you model the patterns for what success for other people have been. That is the surest way to get there. Um, And I think it works for a lot of people. But what I think I've come to realize is if you have a different picture of what that success is, or if you want to help people in a different way, then what you really just have to stay true to is your own personal picture of what that could be. Ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Claire, how's it going? Life is good. Appreciate you coming on. Oh, you um, bet. So founder of Know Your Team. Yes. Uh, been at it for six years almost. Almost. Five yeah, yeah. Five so and a half a years. Time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And is home San Francisco? Not really. Chicago? Yeah. Okay. Home is always a hard, hard thing to place I'm for me. Same boat. Um, yeah, whenever people are like, yeah, where are you from? I'm like, do you want the long answer? Do you want the short answer? So I was born in Georgia. I lived in Ohio, Washington, Minnesota, and spent the last 11 years in Chicago, and then just very recently moved to San Francisco. My okay, so that's there. recent. Awesome. That what part? Literally, uh, like the city. I'm like, in, I used like, to live in the Mission. Lower Haight, like yeah. right on Buena Vista cool. Park. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really park, cool, and that's where your me. family lives. Yeah, right now. We're, they're not from there. We're not from there, but they moved out there. Uh, so this is a funny story, a funny aside, I guess. Uh, my dad, he's spent his entire career in mechanical engineering, and he has a PhD in mechanical engineering um, and robotics, and decided he wanted to start a company and move into artificial that. intelligence. So he lived in Minnesota with my mom, but was like, this is not the place to start a start a company around AI, and so started teaching himself all sorts of, I mean, machine learning, et cetera, oh, yeah. and now is the director of AI at this company in San Francisco. So they literally, three years ago, packed up all their stuff, moved to an apartment in San Francisco, like sold their house on the lake. Do you have brothers or sisters? And, yeah, and I have a younger brother. who He works at Google. And okay. no, and they were just like, oh, here we are, and we don't know anyone. And I love that. I mean, obviously yeah. later in life, like that's so cool. To- like just, it's, it, I don't know if it's a weird thing to say that you're proud of your parents, but I'm proud of them. Inspired by them? Totally. I mean, I'm inspired just, like it's just that's so <laughs> right? cool to know that it's like- so rad. They, like, reset. Exactly. Like, it's never too late. Like, yeah. whatever dream you have, whatever you want to build, just to do it. Age is not, is, is I love what, it. but a number. Um, so. and, and it's cool that your brother's at Google and you're going to be there. So it's like yeah. the family can. It's a whole family thing. That's really neat. I was really reluctant, though. I'm not going to lie to yeah. to move out there. Yeah. I, and we'll, we'll get into this. Um, the company that I run, it's, it's a little weird, mm-hmm. especially by sort of your typical tech industry standards and we'll I've talk, always, I wanted to ask you about I know that it yeah. was kind of spun out from 37 signals aka base camp yes. so Jason and DHH who yes. a lot of my you know audience are familiar with cool um and your background you know first time we've got to meet but I mm-hmm. definitely uh, know your work it's you know oh, artists you. as a background and like how did how <laughs> and then did some consulting and then exactly yeah, yeah. so how did start another company in there too yeah it's all it's and all you're weird in Chicago so that makes sense yeah the whole connection totally I mean um the <sighs> what is the product just for those that okay can't yeah figure it out by the name Sure. So, so we help, right? It's an IQ your test. Uh, wink, wink. Um, no, we build software that helps managers avoid becoming a bad boss. So we yeah. provide educational content, online tools to help you run one-on-one meetings, to get feedback from your team, to build trust. And then we also have an online community with over a thousand managers from all over the world. And you have some big clients and as customers. Yeah. I mean, everyone from managers who are, you know, they're a Dropbox or Airbnb or MailChimp. Um, and we, yeah, we work with over 15,000 people in over 25 countries. And we do it with, there's just four of us. That's cool. And yeah, we've been profitable since fr- day month one, not day one. That is, that is not true. <laughs> uh, but definitely month one, we've been running it for the past five years. And actually very recently, um, just, ooh, wow, only like three months ago, accepted our very first investment ever. Cool. Uh, yeah, we uh, accepted a half million dollars from IndieVC, which yep. is, um, yeah. yeah, for folks who aren't familiar, it's, uh, it's a fund that is focused on supporting companies that want to be profitable and build long lasting businesses. And that's Bryce? And yeah, Bryce Roberts, yeah, yeah of OATV cool. and Tim O'Reilly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we're honored to get to partner with them. And the the story of how you know the guys at 37 Signals, like, 
Yeah, it's a weird one. I've got a lot of weird stories for you, right? Dan. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, uh, well, I'll, I'll back up for a second. So I, I went to school um, in right outside Chicago. I went to Northwestern. Mm-hmm. Um, I was student body president. I that's where I discovered really my love for entrepreneurship. I took an entrepreneurship class there and was like, whoa, you can make money solving problems for people. Like this is a job. What? Uh, crazy like my mom's a, an artist and a designer my dad's a mechanical engineer and so I just I don't know I it just kind of thought a lot of sense now it, it's it's kind Two of like influences yeah yeah those the, the influence of both art design and then um, and emotion and communication and people and being really heart-centered I definitely get from my mom and then the sort of ability to I don't know see things more systemically yeah. and you know really seek out truth and, and, and answers and that sort of math background I definitely get from my dad um, so it's always been this collision of, of worlds for me but I um, yeah while I was there I was like oh whoa oh, I think I want to start a company. Like, this is like my thing. So I started a company coming out of school. It was the first uh, beginner-focused software school in Chicago. So this is like almost 10 years ago before there were any coding boot camps. Yeah, there's a lot now. I mean, there's like almost too many in some ways, right? It's a total commodity. you started the first one. Yeah, first one in Chicago. It was one of the first in the country. It was called Code Academy Mm -hmm. um, and then became the Starter League. And our uh, the only investor was actually um, Jason and David from Basecamp. So Basecamp actually invested in us. Actually, they invested in us after I left the company, but it explains a little bit of my connection to them, which okay, happens. Okay, so they if you, were familiar. You mm-hmm. reach. How did you guys like? How so did how we ended up them? getting connected is I then I left the starter league because I wasn't really sure if that's what I wanted to do. I went to go work at another so company. So you rebranded Code Academy? Yes, to the starter league, which is different. Okay, because I remember. Because there's different. Code Academy. There's also something called Code Academy, which is purely online. Totally two different. Okay, companies. I remember I yeah. went in Chicago. I believe I spoke at some kind of meetup. For it might have been your thing back it actually in the might day. Have been. Back in the <laughs> I day, love this, that. this that was, yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, if you're I running a monthly event and there's a bunch yeah. of speakers, yeah, yeah, that might have been it. Yeah. That might have been us. That's cool. Maybe we met. I have yeah. no idea. Who? Yeah. That's a hilarious. Lot of yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it ended up being an extremely successful company. I mean, we taught thousands and thousands of people in person you know, yeah. who flew in from all over the world to, to take our classes. Yeah. But I wasn't sure if that's what I was wanted like to do long term. Yep, three yeah. month. Yeah. Um, at the time, people were like, uh, I don't understand who your market is, Claire. Like, who's going to pay, you know, 10 grand to learn how to code? Is that even, like, possible? Mm. And then, again, now, wow, today, it's so like, early. yeah, it was really, we were really, really early. Um, and, yeah, learned a lot. But I was so young. I was, like, 21, 22, and I just wasn't sure if that's what I wanted to do for the I don't know. Just yeah. yeah. Is just that the problem you want to exactly invest your time on? Exactly, yeah. and really, really go deep on. And so I ended up working at uh, another early stage startup, and I did a little bit of everything for them. They were a really small companies, so everything from marketing to sales to operations. And when I was there, Dan, I hated my job. And the reason I hated my job was because I had a terrible boss. So this is actually. Very much the inspiration for me, even to this day, of why I feel like (laughs) the problem of helping people become better leaders is possibly one of the most high leverage sort of things to solve for in in our world because it affected my happiness as an employee at the time so deeply. I I know there's a quote. I don't know who said it. It's probably give an attribution, but it's like people don't quit companies, they quit bosses. Exactly. Right. I mean, and there's countless of statistics, whether it's Gallup or other, you know, other polls that have have seen that. But um, I had, I'd studied learning and organizational change when I was in school. And so like, I'd known, okay, this is. And do you think this boss was, did he know he was bad? Okay. So this is the thing. And this is what really got me. He had no idea. Wow. He's like one of those people who is a you know, wonderful person. And, you know, you sit across from him at a coffee shop and he tells you your vision or his vision and, you know, how he wants to invest in you and paints his picture. And you're like, oh, yeah, this is great. And then you actually go into work and it's, uh, you know, sort of his way or the highway or not asking for feedback or um, inconsistent. Right. Or playing favorites. And I just it drove me crazy and so I was like wow he has absolutely no idea he actually thinks he's a good leader Mm. right and here's the other thing it's not like this is a big company this is like a six person startup so can you imagine the magnitude of this problem and unawareness for leaders who are running even you know 20 person (laughs) teams or companies let alone 60 or 600 or 6,000 so I just was like I'm going to make this my life's work I'm going to quit my job I'm going to start a company to help leaders become better and 
and, and I mean the by the way, I mean it's just it's like hilarious when I think about this because I was like 23 at the yeah. time and just but just felt like I don't know what this company is going to be. I don't really care. I don't care how long it takes. As long as that's the problem. We're I just on. that's it. This is this is this is like what I feel like I'm meant to do. And yeah. so I took some time off to do a bunch of research and develop a methodology. And once I sort of had a hint of that, I thought, okay, I'll I, you know a way for me to learn whether or not this methodology is true around how do you create an open and honest environment for leaders to actually get that feedback so they understand whether or not they're a good leader and then what they should be doing better, I felt like I had to test it. So I started consulting practice, working with CEOs one-on-one to really test that. And so here's where we get back to the Basecamp connection. My very first official client was actually the co-founders of Basecamp. Whoa. So yeah, so I got connected to, or reconnected rather, to to Jason They were paying clients? My very first, yeah. Because like everybody from the outside would assume like they've got their stuff figured out. Oh yeah. Well, or was it just a weird time? Because I know that like they grew really fast at one point. Yeah. Well, and fast by their standards. Yeah. Is, was this when they got different. the new office? I knew that was like a. So big... they. Um, this is after the office, but okay. what it, it was more about size than it was about pace of growth. It okay. was Jason, the CEO, felt like hmm, we're forty people, we're spread all over the world, and this is the first time in running the company for almost 15 years that I just feel like I'm losing touch. He's like, I don't know people's last names. Like, I feel like people don't know who I am. I f- it's, he's like, I feel like I'm a, my, a, you know, a stranger in my own company in some ways. And so he and I had connected. I told him what I was working on and he was like, whoa, whoa, Claire, Claire. <laughs> like, this is my biggest problem as a CEO right now. I don't know my team and I want to, I don't, I don't want to be a, a founder who just sort of lets go of the reins and just everything you know falls off the rails eventually. It's like mm-hmm. I would like some intentionality behind how I'm interacting with folks and helping them feel like it's an environment for them to do their best work. So like, how do we how do we do that? Can you can you come in and and, and do a project for us? So I did that, and it went extremely well. They actually it ended up validating a lot of the methodology that I'd been developing, which today is actually baked into know your team Mm -hmm. um and then the other interesting thing is they actually changed some stuff in the company which is pretty cool you know it's always sort of as a consultant right like that's like fingers crossed yeah they're paying (laughs) for it point right it's not just the pretty slide deck hopefully and then the other interesting part of um our conversation was he was like claire this is also highly ironic um but we are coincidental rather uh we happen to be building this um software product on the side. It's like a prototype um, and it's called Know Your Company and it's a tool that helps CEOs like me get get feedback and I would love for you to take a look at it. And did they build this because Jason was in that problem space Precisely. already? Yeah. Yes, you nailed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's obviously there. He just like, built stuff for himself, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And it was kind of like this fun thing of like, yeah. I don't know if we'll just even... Ask a question. Yeah, he's yeah. like, I don't even know if we're going to like open it up to the public yeah. or like, I don't I don't know what it's going to be. Like actually originally what it was, it was more of sort of an employee CRM more than anything okay. and less of a feedback tool and yeah. actually after a lot of conversation with him it sort of started to move in that direction yeah. but anyway we went on our separate paths and they started building out what was then called know your company i was actually building my own software product at the time myself oh, wow. and I, I took like a job as a part-time uh, hostess at a restaurant working nights and weekends you know to like pay myself and i'm trying to sell uh you know consulting clients and, and you know, i'm building this software product and i'm like running out of money wow. and just like you know i'm just like ah is this the whole thing gonna work right that classic story of just trying to, you know, just trying to build build the thing. Um, and I'm getting to this point where I'm like, oh, man, like, oh my, my. I'd set aside about 10 months worth of savings when yeah. I started on this this journey. And, you know, I got paid from, from base camp. Um, but it's now about a year or so. And I'm like, oh, hmm, this is interesting. Am I going to have to get a real job? Like, bank account's really low. Like, I have a bunch of, I have like 10 potential clients who've all verbally told me yes. Yeah, but there's no, yeah, there's no, yeah, yeah, there's no check. Like, started. what's... Oh God! Like who? <laughs> it's that like hot under the collar feeling. Totally. And it was right around that time. So this is the end of I want to say yeah, end of 2013. Um, Jason reached back out to me and he said, Claire, um, I I have this crazy idea I want to talk to you about. And we sat down and he proposed that they take Know Your Company at the time, which they actually had then by then had started selling it actually okay. as a product and it had started getting traction. What year was this? End of 2013. Okay. Yep. And it started getting traction. And he was like, we have this product and it's making money, but uh, 
it has nothing really to do with Basecamp yeah. and all of our other products. And I'm actually trying to get rid of these other project like products. We're oh, trying was to when go, he was trying to. I think he exact, had high rise. He was so trying to get rid exactly, of that. it was when yeah. he was truly trying to go all in on um, Basecamp, Basecamp. And he's like, I don't know what to do with it, but I have this thought. He's like, What if we actually spun it out to be its own separate company? So separate LLC. Uh, you become the CEO. Um, you we split equity 50 50. Um, you don't get any team or anything, but you'll get the customers. You'll get the product. What do you think? And I was like, "You look at <laughs> like how did this just materialize in my life?" I like, yeah, just I it's mean, cool. I was twenty four. Like yeah. I was like, "This is stupid." But what's neat about Jason <laughs> is if you watch the arc of of his career, he, I mean, his the the deal with David is similar, right? Yeah. Where they're like, "Hey, let's build this thing, and why don't we become partners?" Yeah. And, you know, he's done this with High Rise and a bunch of other. Yep. It, it's just it's just really neat because he, you know, I think a lot of founders sometimes feel like what they created this special thing, and I'm gonna raise capital and, and hire a GM and and not really kind of be, um, mm-hmm. um, you know, generous. Yes. And it sounds like he was extremely generous with the oh, structure. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I think um, I, I've learned so much from both him and David, but one of the things I appreciate most is he has an incredible ability to know what he wants and to stay true to what he wants while at the same time being open to the fact that information that could look like a lot of different things like why not why not like it's funny like not a lot of companies i mean choose even the deal structure that we did it was super simple we split equity 50 50 and then actually the agreement was when uh, we hit a million dollars in cumulative revenue that my share would get bumped up to 75 and theirs would actually get bumped to 25 and so that happened a few years ago so he was even willing to sort of like give an incentive for upside yeah Um, and for them it was just because he knew what he wanted which is I mean, for them, they were like, this New York company thing is just yeah. this, like, ugh, we don't really care. <laughs> but we don't want it to go away. <laughs> but we don't want it to go away, and, like, maybe it'd be cool, important. and, like, Claire, you seem a lot more aligned and interested in it than we ever would be. Yeah. And just sort of, you know, getting it off his plate. And for me, it's, like, opportunity of a lifetime. It's, like, literally exactly what I've wanted to what do. What were the features in the early days? Dead simple, right? So it was literally just a almost like a giant question bank around three different questions. And it's still a big part of the product yeah. um, that help you understand what's going on in the team. Um, so everything and from it's culture. No, all public. Okay. And then um, Is like public a, anonymous or public and public and within the uh, no, there's no a- anonymity whatsoever. Okay. Yep. So and you that, write it and people know mm-hmm. you wrote it. Exactly. Okay. And then a series of questions that are called social questions that are around things like um, what was your first job or, um, you know, would you ever get a tattoo or do you have a tattoo or uh, how do you like your eggs? Um, and then um, a rotating question around what are you working on? So the idea being that the three biggest things that most people don't know about in their company are what are people working on? How do you feel about the company? And just like, who are you? Who are you? And <laughs> like, did you discover this doing your research? Yeah, yeah. It was a big part of the research that I did. Um, but I, I think, uh, I mean, full credit to Jason. Intuitively, it was just the problems, the three biggest questions that he faced personally. So he came as to that CEO. realization mm-hmm. on his own. Yeah, wow. absolutely. And so the product has evolved significantly since then because originally it was called Know Your Company, and today we are Know Your Team, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, it, the the product was uh, focused specifically actually towards CEOs, right? So Jason built this for himself. So it was CEOs of small companies, anywhere from twenty to seventy five people. That was like the pain point for mm-hmm. that. 20 exactly. Plus is where it to exactly. Um, and even the pricing model was was really different. So it was a pretty weird price model where it was a one-time pricing um, per person for life. So it was actually $100 per person for life, not per seat. Okay. So let's say you have 20 employees, so then it's two grand, right? Yeah. And then but you didn't get a seat. So if somebody left and came back, they had to pay another 100 bucks. Exactly. So the idea is that as, as the company grows, it's $100, right? Yeah. And it was brilliant in some ways because what it allowed us to do is actually collect uh, sort of the lifetime value of a customer up front, right? Mm. And so we were able to become profitable and insanely quickly because yeah. of it otherwise we would have had to wait like 19 yeah, months to see yeah. the you know yeah. the same same collection um so it was really interesting from that standpoint and then the other thing that was um fascinating was the way it actually Im- uh, influenced behavior from the customer side so because you are asking someone to pay up front right and you're talking to the ceo directly in all of these you know conversations this means that the energy that the person is going to put behind getting people on board getting them to use it Know Your Company was very much a program than it was just a feedback mm. app. 
So we actually saw higher engagement, uh, you know, wonderful customer success actually because of the pricing model. So we stuck with that pricing model and with that very specific customer segment for a good few years. Um, the sales model was also really interesting. So uh, for the first about year and a half, the way we sold the product is the only way you could even see it. We didn't do a free trial. You, there were no screenshots of the product online for like over a year. And the only way that you could even try the product was you had to schedule a uh, WebEx demo wow. with me for 30 minutes. Wow. So I did in the first almost two years uh, over 500 demos, demos and calls with CEOs. Um, about the product. It was all referral based? Um, a lot of it was referral based and then um, a lot of it was from content. So a lot of the writing and the speaking mm. that I did. So another thing that we focused on in the first two years is I did just a ton of speaking. Yeah. So much more than I do now. I actually really cut back on the speaking that I do in the, pa- in the past few years. And the reason behind that is, you know, when we're just starting out, like no one knows who we are. Yeah. And if the premise of our product is essentially selling an expertise. Well, like, what, what's the expertise? If yeah. We don't know, like, we don't know who Claire is, right? So speaking was a wonderful way to establish credibility. It was also a great way to sort of test messages and understand what the real pains that people were feeling. Um, and then because we knew that we had a really very sort of tight, narrow target segment that we could actually go to the conferences where we knew, knew exactly where the CEOs were going to be. What so. have you learned about making events? Because um, a lot of people ask, like, how hmm. do I... Yeah. How do you make them productive, right? Mm. Because, you know, you see some founders, they're always speaking. It's like, when do you actually get any work done? You don't, though. Yeah. I don't like, did you just get well, better at choosing the ones where you knew you had a high percentage of Yeah, and I clients? think, well, I think the first thing is to, to define for oneself, like, what that productivity actually means. So, productivity in the sense of, uh, like, a leads, does it mean actually closing deals? Does it mm-hmm. mean influence and credibility? So, in the beginning, for me, it wasn't necessarily closing deals. It was actually reach and credibility. And so, it was about audience size. It was about... Um, shares. It was about, you know, we did a lot of sponsorships and partnerships. And then um, over time, we could see how that translated into to actual revenue. Um, I think the way that I thought about it then was um, what's the likelihood that I'm actually going to have a real conversation with someone who can buy our product? Because if I know that if I talk to them, like we'll close them. Yeah. Like, I, I think right. if I, yeah, if yeah. I talk to them, like, We'll yeah. get it. So if you can get on um, stage, you can kind of see a bunch of potential future conversations. Yeah. And what's yeah. interesting about that, too, is it doesn't necessarily mean even um, uh, like a big conference, right? So what we actually ended up doing and what was a really fruitful partnership was um, I spoke at a series of small, intimate, exclusive CEO-only um, sort of roundtable events or three-day conferences. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a there's a wonderful agency um, focus uh, speaker series event called Owner Camp, where they have you know you have to be a, an agency owner and you know you do three or four days, right? And so you have this sort of cohort feel. So we did a lot of things like that that ended up being wonderfully you know mutually beneficial yeah. for everybody. Um, and then here's here's the thing though, Dan, like. This stuff doesn't scale, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's only it's one of me. good in the early days, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's only one of me. Um, and what we started realizing is obviously once you get to a certain point, um, yeah, you want to you wanna get things out there a little bit more. And uh, we started noticing, yeah, a lot of really, like, a lot of really interesting signs that pointed that we needed to just start trying something different um, and in transitioning the business in a way. Actually, a, a beautiful analogy that um, David, uh, DHH, the, the other co-founder of Basecamp, uh, he actually shared <laughs> with me when we were talking this over during a board meeting, is he said, uh, comedians, Claire, uh, when, they, when they get their start, you know, they go to the clubs. And they hone their lines and they try different jokes and, you know, and they get to talk with your audience a little bit more intimately and you play the clubs for years, right? And then you get to a certain point where you feel like you really know what your lines are. It's like, then you take your show to HBO, right? So there's a point in time 
right when you're ready to sort of go mass market. So um, this is probably about two or three years ago where we're like, yeah, no, it's it's time. <laughs> like enough WebEx demos. Like yeah. I, I've Open picked. It up. I mean, you can imagine from each of those conversations yeah. the amount of precision we were able to get about language and jobs to be done, and really understanding the mindset of what exactly are leaders who are struggling to get yeah. a hold of what their teams are thinking and feeling, what are they facing? Yeah. Um, and so like once we got that, uh, we said, all right, let's 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 switch this up, right? So we, you know, opened it up to be self sign up and then I transitioned to doing a lot more writing, which is much more scalable, yeah, scalable. and mass I mean and but to an extent some people would argue, well Claire, that's not very scalable either because yeah. I don't we don't outsource any of our writing. Mm-hmm. I mean we have hundreds and thousands of people who visit our blog and read our stuff. I mean a, a Big, you know, a, a hit post will see, you know, easily get half a million views and be shared on Business Insider and CNBC and, you know, crazy coverage. And I'm, I'm the only person All writing. writing. <laughs> I, you know, we don't hire people to yeah. do it. And there's no ghostwriter. I don't have an editor. It's just, yeah. it's just me. And so, to an extent, too, it's like at some point that's not necessarily scalable. But a little scale more scalable Either, than right, speaking. Right. Right. Um, and the idea is shareable as yeah. well. It's a little harder to, to, to transfer. Like, oh, she gave yeah, this great yeah. talk, and these yeah, are the yeah. main points, and you know, Doesn't sharing that with her. No, easily. exactly. So that was a big, big shift that we made um, that started getting a lot of a lot of traction. Uh, but then we started noticing something really interesting about a year and a half ago. I would say, maybe two years ago. Yeah which is we saw sort of really insane um, traffic growth. So over a 10-month period, we actually saw our ch- like organic traffic increase for, by like 10x, just wow. like crazy, or like zero paid. Okay. At, this is all organic traffic. Is it keywords from, that just started getting in yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Um, from the writing that I was doing, and we're like, oh, this is, this is great. Okay, that's, that's, well, it's great, but... Hmm, our sales are not 10x. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> conversion yeah. here. This is interesting. Like one part of the equation is not 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 fitting with the narrative. Like what's what's going on? Like at first we we're like is this a fluke in the data and we're like, "Hmm, no, this is weird. Like sales are flat." Flat. And we're so what's 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 up? So we took a took a closer look and what we realized is that the people who are reading our blog posts and visiting our marketing site were managers. They weren't CEOs yeah. between 25 to 75 employees. They weren't looking for a feedback tool. These were actually new managers in particular who were like starved for content about yeah, being a better manager. Exactly. How do I run my first one on one meeting? How do you set goals? Um, what, what does it even mean to be a manager? What, how do you delegate? I have to run my first staff meeting next week. What do I put on that agenda? Yeah. And we started doing some research and realizing actually the resources, let alone tools that are out it's there. No for the ideal customer oh my, profile. Yeah, it's just like there's, when you think about how we learn anything in life, right? It's like, oh, there's a path, right? Yep. And you have like a, a sort of like a foundation of knowledge and you practice it and there's like sort of experts you can go to or I coaches. I call them frustration flows. Yeah, there, there's a path yeah. to get better. And leadership is this one area where no one's really figured it out. Like if you, you know, let's you you hire a new manager and you're like, okay, cool. You know, I've never managed before. What do I do? People are like, oh, uh, read these books. Yeah. And you read the books and you're like, okay, but (laughs) reading the books and doing the thing are completely different. It's like asking someone to uh, learn how to ride a bike by reading the book. That doesn't work, right? Yeah. So you're like, oh, okay, well, 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 you you can go to business school, and you're like, "Mm, that's really expensive and Time Again, consuming. do you really learn? Uh, are you, you know? Yeah. Okay, do these workshops. Okay, do the workshop, or you talk to the executive coach. Both expensive. Yeah. And then again, you have to go apply the things. And there's this gap of hearing and taking in what someone's saying, or you know, writing down in your workbook. And by the way, we do workshops, right? Yeah. But there's still a gap. It's not the ideal solution. So our our hypothesis was, well, could we create a learning path for new managers? Mm. And could it be a combination of content, online tools? and a support of the community. So we decided, hmm, as we look at what Know Your Company is, we almost have, <laughs> we have the opposite problem that most startups have, which is we have an audience, but uh, we, don't, we don't have the product. We have the wrong product, right? Our product right now is for CEOs and it's for feedback, and our audience is huge, managers. but it's managers. And for most startups, you know, it's the inverse. Yeah, it's like, yeah, oh, I got this product, that. and, you know, I got to find people who, you know, who, who are going to like it. So we're like, all right, well, 
I guess I guess we got to get a new product. So we rebuilt the product. You rebuilt it? Yeah. <laughs> All of last really? year. Yeah. Um, that a was lot the of rebrand. When did the rebrand? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. We launched it in December um, okay. this past year. So it's yeah. been about eight months. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, we're a really small team. Like we're yeah. bootstrapped, right? Um, at the time, we were just two people. Mm-hmm. And we rebuilt the whole thing. So this is product features. This is marketing site. We changed the company name from Know Your Company, Know Your Team. We changed the, the billing system yeah. because we also thought, no, if you're yeah, a new it. manager, you're not. Yeah, it's not. doesn't make any sense for that price point. Relaunched everything um, and crossed our fingers. Always been, scary. Oh, my God. I mean, in so hindsight. So far, so good? It's been wonderful. Okay. Yeah, it's been wonderful. I mean, yeah, you know. now you have a product aligned with the message of your marketing that you've been doing. So you have traffic. You can exactly. monetize the traffic. Exactly. Um, and, of course, with any sort of new thing, you're, you're like, pushing this big boulder up the hill. And then it, like, kind of slides back. And you're pushing it. And there's so many things. Uh, you know, you're always your own worst critic. So I'm always just like, oh, there's all these things that we want to do. Uh, but the thing that I'm most just excited about is just the fact that the way that we are helping people is actually working. Like, that's been, Oh, that's cool. That's the coolest. That's the reason why you do it. And in the space, I know there's, you know, tools like Office Vibes, yeah. 15 5, mm-hmm. um, and a ton of others. It, it seems definitely like a category that's become more um, yeah. interesting. How do you guys kind of differentiate or position against that? Like, Yeah, it's so good to ask that. I mean, especially in light of, of April's talk, who yeah. we just saw here at, at Business of Software. Yeah. Um, so the thing that most tools do is what most tools are good at, which is they give you features. So they say, use this for your one-on-one meetings, use this for setting your goals, use this for feedback. What they don't do is they don't give you the methodology. So that's the difference, is we actually give you content, we give you expert opinion, advice, recommendations. Does it show up in the tool? Yes, it's oh, in the tool. Cool. So in yeah. context. Exactly, in context. And this isn't just like, oh, Claire's, Experience consultant. No, this is actually based off all the data we've collected over the past five years with over 15,000 people. We run actually studies on specific subject areas. So, for example, for one on one meetings, we actually have a guide in Know Your Team that you can read that's pulled, you know, data pulled from over 2,000 people that'll tell you that the most common frequency for people for running one on ones. It's actually weekly, which surprises a lot of people. It's pretty yeah. often. Yeah. The most common duration is anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour. Um, it'll tell you that over 80% of managers find having one-on-one meetings to be very effective. It'll tell you that employees actually see that effectiveness is about 16 percentage points less, meaning there's a huge gap between how effective an employee versus their manager thinks Interesting. one-on-ones are, right? So it's yeah. sort of like the whole idea is you can't actually change behavior unless you give people reason, context to do so. And so if these tools in Office 5 or 15.5, which are excellent, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, doing excellent. what they do. Yeah, and but... doing what they do, that's great. But if you actually want to help a new manager create good habits, become better, and not just <laughs> turn on a tool and they have to like force themselves Review every week to do it, and right. stuff. rather than actually understanding how this is valuable, a way to integrate it into their day-to-day process, and then understanding, oh, in addition to just doing the one-on-one every week, I should actually prepare for that, <laughs> right? Oh, the right? Crazy. I mean, it's, it's crazy the number of managers, the majority of managers don't prepare for their one-on-one meetings. At all. Most managers don't want to do one on one meetings. Oh, there we go. Right, exactly. Yeah. Let alone doing doing the one ons, right? We're we're already making a, a big yeah. assumption here that they're yeah. doing them. Uh, but it's um And would you would you yeah. argue that that meeting is probably the most effective tool a manager has to align their team's productivity yes. and provide the space for feedback to improve? Yes. Like it's it is it's the it's definitely the highest leverage, like um, in person time that you can have with yeah. with your direct report. I, I mean, just, just for context and software, Andy Grove wrote yeah, about it exactly. in High Put Output Management. Yeah. Uh, Jason Lemkin said yep. he would fire managers that didn't do it. Um, ben Horowitz talked about mm-hmm. it in his book. Like yep. one on ones are non negotiables. Yes, especially in my world, high growth SaaS companies. Like exactly. it's a not it's a no it's a must. It is a must. Um, so the product started off as kind of like a really neat. Uh, way to know your team at scale, right? Mm-hmm. The context of their world, their life, what are they working on? Um, and then it's evolved. What, yeah. what, what does it look like today? 
Yeah. So today what it looks like is really having that entire ecosystem, right, to become a better manager. So we have these educational guides that are all online. And you also, when you add your team, your employees get a version too. And so you can actually read guides that I've written based off all of this research on how to build trust in your team. So what are the most effective ways to build trust? What does that look like? How do you integrate that into your one-on-one meetings? What questions should you ask? What activities should you do? So there's a whole guide on that. Um, we give you guides on one-on-one meetings, on- Quarterly sh- offsites or team um, offsites or anything like that? Oh yeah, all of that. Yeah. Um, on shifting culture, on um, uh, creating context, um, setting direction um, in a team. And actually the one that we're about to, uh, to release uh, for customers tomorrow is on managing remote teams. Cool. So you have this edu- big. yes, big one, um, and that that one took yeah a big chunk of time to write. I'm really really excited about it. Um, but the whole idea being that it gives you a foundation of knowledge and context to understand what are things that different companies and different teams do. Because a huge problem with most leadership content that you look up, because there's no shortage of it, right? Like HBR or Forbes or whatever. I mean, you Google right leadership. It's there, there's no shortage of that. But the problem with most of that content is all of it is is based off a very particular either dogmatic school of thought or someone's own personal experience, like mm. Ray Dalio or uh, Jack Welsh. And it's like that, that worked great for them and oh for Bridgewater gosh. and for like Energy. When I read principles, for, I was like, yeah, that works when you have an industry <laughs> where you can back test every hypothesis. I mean, <laughs> right. And it's, I don't know does, another industry that's and, got that ability. Right. And, and it's always helpful to have those those data points. But yeah. the what makes leadership effective is actually understanding context. It's be able, being able to see the broad range of what potential um, actions you could take and decisions you could make and then being able to pick which ones and tailor Sequence. that to exactly that specific person in the specific s- situation in the specific um, context. That's what that's what the best leaders are able to do is to filter that very quickly and to have a range, uh, a, a broad range of that that like knowledge bank of potential situations and outcomes. So that's what we try to give managers in a way that's not overwhelming, in a way that's really curated and backed by by data. So that's that's what you get with the guides, right? And then the second step is well, it, it, it's nice to learn stuff, it's, but. But this is the problem with books, right? Is and tr- I'm I'm not hating on books. I love books. Yeah. But if you want to do something after you read the book, it's quite a bit of energy, right? And so that's where tools come in. So we have these online tools, these software tools that we've built, where you can apply what you've learned. So for example, you read the building trust guide, and then you can turn on our icebreaker tool, which automatically helps onboard a new employee, ask five fun questions, helps to build trust. And because you've read the building guide or building um, building trust guide, you understand. Oh, this is actually helping to build. Um, effective trust, right? Um, and affective trust is, uh, you know, different than cognitive trust because it's all about creating social bond. And oh, the social bond is important because it's going to have people create, you know, greater loyalty. People, you know, we we understand that that's going to help, you retention. know, retention. It's not just like yeah. oh, I'm turning on this, you know, Feature. asking just like fun questions yeah. because it's fun. It's like no. Yeah. It's again, it's like creating that pathway for someone to actually change their behavior over a long term, right? So there's that. There's the one on ones tool that people can, you know, use. And then based off the guide, they understand how to use it better. Uh, we have stuff on culture questions to ask to get feedback, um, heartbeat questions so people are on the same page. Um, so you don't have to do a. A weekly staff meeting, you know, if you're remote, you can just use our heartbeat feature um, and, you know, a bunch of other stuff. But just just to give you something to actually then apply what you've learned. And then what you have access to is we have our online community. It's called The Water Cooler. And you can actually sign up for it independent of KYT. So you can, you know, it's 20 bucks a month. Um, but what's really nice is if you do subscribe to Know Your Team. That methodology. Yeah. It's all a part of all the research we've done to just help you stay more accountable. So you have thousands of managers who you can talk to and have threads about. Hey, I'm running into this issue. Oh, my God. It's so, I yeah. learn stuff all the time. It's well, like, there's a challenge. Managers, I yeah. just feel like, especially with like these tools, it makes so much Thing, so many things public like slack you mm-hmm. know it's all of a sudden like they're like somebody said this how do i respond you know what's my yep what am i responsible for um you mentioned like kind of the great managers you know have this knowledge bank but like what are yeah. the things if you had to pick the three proverbial three things that a great leader manager yep um has based on your guys's research yep. what they're, would you yeah funny 
three is the number. Okay, actually, cool. Which is funny. So based yeah. off the research we've done, and this is what the product is built around in our methodology, is there are three things we found in common that the best managers tend to do. And so the first is around trust and building trust. And without that foundation of trust, then you can't do every, you know, anything else. Um, and trust, people get a really confused sometimes what you even mean by trust. Like a lot of times people tr uh, equate trust with likability. That's that's not what trust is. Trust is your intention matching your behavior. Intention and that, matching mm -hmm. behavior. And that linkage. So uh, this means that and we did a big study around, you know, the best ways to build trust. So, for example, um, some people might assume, oh, building trust like quarterly offsites and like, you know, asking about people's hobbies and like being transparent with company information. Like That seems like those things would build trust. And actually, all of those things rank lowest in terms of building trust and the things that rank highest are showing vulnerability as a leader admitting your mistakes mm. and following through on your on the stuff that you say integrity with your word it's all about doing what you say you're gonna do and then saying what you're gonna do too you have to do that part say first say what you're gonna do and then doing it do it that builds trust that build and it's what that's cognitive and trust. the vulnerability aspect exactly yeah so anywho building trust that's the first thing second is honesty and communicating honestly so the idea being that if the reason teams exist is to get something done that you couldn't get done alone as an individual, the only way that progress is made is if the communication that's happening is as true to what is actually happening. So that's why feedback so important. That's why mm -hmm. having one-on-one -on -one meetings is so important is to get so You're saying that. sometimes the communication mm -hmm. is actually filtered mm -hmm. or decorated a certain way. That's or not actually at all not, happening. It's not even happening. Yeah. Exactly. So communicating honestly. So that's all around not even just um, giving feedback, but even the way you receive feedback mm -hmm. tempers and sets the tone for how people in your team communicate. For example, if someone gives you feedback that's like, I don't know, something you don't want to hear, you know, you're just like, oh, I just really don't want to hear that. Like, I know yeah. that, but I don't want to hear that. Yeah. And you just like, you know, you just see my body language like, ah. Yeah. You get defensive, or you don't say anything, yeah. or you don't follow Product's up. Slow. It's like, yeah, yeah, you're like, know. okay, great, cool. Yeah. You know, you can only imagine what that response that you just did does for the likelihood that that person is ever going to share a similar piece of feedback to you again. Mm. Like people wonder why echo chambers happen, or people wonder why. Oh, how, how did that person not speak up? Is hmm, I wonder what happened the first time someone spoke up. Mm -hmm. Maybe they got yelled at. Maybe they got fired. Maybe you know nothing happened. So there's no incentive to change. So we don't even think about like there's so much around just and, response. Exactly, and I'm I'm actually giving a workshop on this on on Wednesday here about the culture of feedback. That actually it's this in interesting virtuous cycle around how you ask for feedback, receive, act on feedback, and give feedback, that sets the tone for how likely people are to say the truth. And so that's that's a huge part of uh, what a leader has to be very intentional about is creating those channels of communication making sh and honesty, right? So mm -hmm. that's number two. And then number three is context. So people need to know why they're doing stuff the and lie. where they're going <laughs> and what they're doing. <laughs> That's right. It's, it seems obvious. Um, but it's, uh, it's so hard to do in practice because as leaders, it's so, we it, just assume people it's know. It's in here. Yeah. It's in here. We've been doing it. We've been and telling you. It's like, I told you last I, quarter. I just said it yesterday. Like, isn't it obvious? Um, and it's amazing how many times we have leaders come to us who say, yeah, my team has no idea what we're working on or my company has no idea. Like people maybe in this group does, but they don't understand how it rolls up to the bigger picture. And so context is a lot of things. Um, it's, uh, it's vision, which is a big part that a lot of leaders miss. So understanding the picture of the better place that you're trying to create. So w what does it look like? when we finish successful. And leaders a lot of times don't spend a lot of time communicating that very clearly. And vision is extremely important for, for motivation. So for, what does success look like? Yeah, it, and the way I frame it even is like a picture of a better place because it's, a, it's very much a literal illustration, yeah. right? It's not this abstract like, oh, it's more innovative. 
that's not vision. Yeah. Vision is not, oh, we should yeah. be more innovative. No. Vision is like a literal description of people's interactions and how their lives are, are different or yeah. the world looks different. So it's a picture of a better place. So vision is the thing that gets a lot of times overlooked. Progress is another big part of context. We often don't share the progress that's being made. Mm-hmm. So a lot, of, um, a lot of managers and CEOs will ask me, Claire, like, what really motivates employees? Can you tell me? Like, what's, what's the real answer, right? And it's interesting. There's a lot of research that's done on this. And you might think it's money or titles or yeah. um, et cetera. And the number, one, or the number one thing that motivates employees on a day-to-day basis is actually making meaningful progress yeah. on work. Progress. Number one thing. So if you're looking for a sustainable People source of People want to win. Yeah. Well, they just want to know that it, like, the, like yeah, we're, we're human we're, beings. Yeah. Like that we matter. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah. like on the most fundamental yeah. existential level, like we look up at the stars and yeah. we're like, what is this all for? Like, oh, does, does anyone care? Like yeah. that's is progress, just yeah. making some sort of meaningful progress. And I, even on a personal level, like when I reflect on my own day of, oh, is today good or not? Yeah. Y- you know, you always feel like you have a shit day when you just feel like you didn't make can't any point at anything. progress. Yeah. Like I did emails. I worked. But I can't point at anything. Right. But yeah. did anything happen? Right. Yeah. So progress is a big part of it. Uh, decisions being shared that helps create context, mm-hmm. um, and then institutional knowledge, so understanding why things have happened in the past. Mm. Um, so, so that's those are the three the three sort of buckets of sort of functional skills. Yeah. Uh, what I would say is a the the foundational understanding that often gets missed, um, sort of that supports those three things is a lot of leaders don't know the purpose of leadership. Mm. Like, why? what is a manager? Like, what's, what are you supposed what, to what's do? What's the answer? And also, well, this is interesting. It's very hotly debated because the concept of leadership was probably introduced by, like, Aristotle. Okay. <laughs> like, there's a very long history of leadership. And if you look back and you reflect on the history of leadership, the number of definitions that have been attempted at leadership, right, for as many um, – uh, for as many attempts that there have been, like th- that's the the number of definitions. Like literally, there's so many. Scholars have not agreed. Like academics who have studied this, like have literally not agreed on a singular and they it. definition. And they debate it all the time. It's so what's, what's interesting. What's right? So, <laughs> exactly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so you kind of have to do some filtering of being like, all right, if no one's agreed, then you, but you got to pick something because yeah. how can you get good at something if you don't define what, what it, it is? is. Uh, and so what what has been just based off all the research that I've done to be sort of the best definition of good leadership is the ability to create an environment for people to do their best work, right? And the key word being environment, right? That's so a it's good not way to frame it. So it's not about influence actually. It's not about setting tasks. It's not about goals, like you didn't hear the word, um, like power even. Yeah. Um it's all about creating an environment. And the reason that's so important is because when you actually look at all the, the, the academics who've studied motivation and how people make progress in teams and the science of teams, people, you actually, you, you can't get someone to ever really do something. Like you can't ever control another person. So if the whole function of a team is to get, is to be able to do something you wouldn't have been able to do on your own and the leader's the person to yeah. get you to try to do those things, yet you can't ever control someone or truly influence someone to do that, then yeah. the best thing you can do, and actually the most sustainable thing to do, and the thing that's going to give you the greatest likelihood to get to where you're trying to go is just to create the out, uh, the environment to do that. Mm-hmm. I also think that framing is important because um, it it helps it helps create pathways for yourself to act on those things in a sustainable way. So as, as a manager, as a leader. As a manager yeah. and as a leader. Yeah, it gives you a kind of um, some rails to think about, like, how should my activities look if my job is to create an environment? Does that really create an environment? Exactly. And, it's, and, and the reason it's so important as well is to, to have that sort of foundation, too, is when you become a manager or a leader, uh, 
it's it's a very confusing process because your definition of success just is completely different than what it ever looked like when you were an individual contributor. So if you were, you know, if you're an employee, you are rewarded for solving problems. You are rewarded for being on time, if not early. You are rewarded for having the answers. You are rewarded for um, being uh, just on top of everything, right? Yeah. Like that's what Read you are re- exactly being everywhere, right? Popping your hand up, and you got the answers. You're doing yes, it, is. yeah. Put you know, rolling your sleeves up. And what's so interesting is when you're a leader, right? Actually, if you are doing your job well. You're not doing that. You should be asking all questions and be having no, no answers. You should not be busy. You should be having an open schedule in order to help other people think through problems for themselves, right? And that that definition of success is really hard to get to unless you actually frame the job as creating an environment for people. Like if you're stuck in this mode of thinking that success equals you executing on the thing yourself and getting the credit for it and being rewarded for that, then you're mm-hmm. not going to be successful as a manager. Yeah. And it's why that transition is so hard for totally. so many individual contributors who you know become managers, people who are so excellent at their craft, or, and yeah. maybe they're even good with people. Like it's not even like a, you know, some people are like, oh, it's you know, it's a social skills thing, and some people just aren't charismatic, mm-hmm. or they just can't, you know, they don't know how to run a meeting. And it's like, well, is that it, or is it? I, I know the book, yeah. uh, One Minute Manager Meets the Monkey. Oh, it was so transformative. Yeah, it's like that's somebody else's monkey, not your monkey. You're mm-hmm. not supposed to actually do the work. Exactly. I mean, buy some insurance on the monkey. Yeah. One of my one of my favorite. Um, I mentioned this to you earlier. You know, I run a podcast. It's called The Heartbeat, and I invite leaders who I look up to and respect. And one of my favorite guests that I've had on the show um, is Michael Lop, who he goes by Rands. He's the VP of Engineering for Slack. Okay. And um, I ask every guest on the show, you know, what's the biggest thing you wish you would have learned earlier? as a manager and he said I wish I would have learned um, to not be busy mm. and he's like we we as as, as people he probably yeah, just I mean, you think, busy, yeah. yeah it's like when you're busy you feel like you're doing a good job you're knocking things out you're saving the day um, we're we live in a society where we're sort of rewarded for, yeah, for, being for busy. that yeah. yeah and he was like when you're busy you actually can't do your job as a manager because if your job is and you know I'm inserting my own framework here yeah, right creating create an environment, environment you can't create that environment if you're the one answering support tickets or talking to the client Breaking or code. fixing bugs exactly um you're going to completely miss the fact that you have someone who's thinking about leaving the company. You're going to completely miss the fact that someone actually disagrees with the strategy. Like you can't like eh. the way the human brain even works is we we can't find salience and make sound decisions when we're distracted. Yeah. <laughs> and being busy means being distracted. It's it's fine. I mean, being busy is great if you're executing, right? And yeah. you're doing the things. But that's not what being a manager is about. It's yeah. not about doing the things. As um, you kind of look at your journey last five, six years, yeah. um, who did you need to become to be <laughs> CEO? Oh, my God, right? Yeah. I love that question. I don't know if anyone's asked me that I question. I love asking that question. In that form. Um, I think I needed to become more myself, which is, and I don't know, it's like if... I feel like if I ever rewatch this back, I'm gonna be like, "Oh God, that sounded so cheesy, Claire. <laughs> Can you retake that?" But I, I guess what what I mean by that is, I I think I'll speak for myself. When I was starting out, um, I always felt like um, the way you be successful is you model the patterns for what success for other people have been. That is the surest way to get there. Um, and I think it works for a lot of people, but what I think I've come to realize is if you have a different picture of what that success is, or if you wanna help people in a different way, then what you really just have to stay true to is your own personal picture of what that could be. And so I think the more that I lean into my vision for how I want to help people, the more that I listen to the like what people are actually needing versus thinking, oh, I see this entrepreneur who's doing this, or I see this company that's doing this, or this is a popular thing to do. Um, sort of, the, I mean, the more 
kind of measurable success we see, whether that's customers or growth or, you know, hiring certain people or exposure, et cetera. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think it's, um, I think it's convenient to feel like other people have it figured out because it means that there's something like tangible that we can grasp and work towards versus understanding that it's, it's inside. A, yeah, it's inside. Like all the answers you kind of have, you already know. Like that's a lot courage. more scary yeah. than it takes courage. Exactly. That's a lot more scary and it's a lot more frightening than like, oh, if only I do yeah. A, B, and C, this and I just gotta checklist. wait, and I just gotta do these things, and I just gotta try yeah, a little oh, harder, and we just gotta raise this money, or we yeah. just gotta, I just gotta hire these people, just versus, um, yeah, it's just different. Yeah, thought. well, I think listening, listening to to yourself. Yeah. Um, one of so I do a, you know a ton of writing obviously for for Know Your Team and uh, one of my my favorite books around um, around writing it's um, on writing well by William Zinsers. So great, yeah. yeah. And he talks about uh, and I remember this blowing my mind when I first read this like I don't know like over ten years ago. As he said, um, the person you're writing for is for yourself. I was like, really? Mm. But it's not. No, I'm writing for you know customers. And, yeah. <laughs> And in many ways, and this is going to sound really weird, I think, to some people, but in many ways, you're building your business for yourself. And not in the sense of like, oh, it's this ego thing, yeah. or I need my face yeah. on magazines, but just in the sense of like, you, there are a lot of ways to make a living in this mm -hmm. world. There's a lot of ways to make an impact in this world. Like the decision to do that by building something from scratch and taking an idea to, to reality and doing it with software, like this is a very intentional decision. And to, to do that without sort of centering around the fact that like you have your own preferences or ideas or opinions or way that you think you could help people like to not listen to that would be almost doing a disservice to why you're even taking this journey to begin with because yeah. if you want to make a bunch of money there's a lot of easier lot of ways, ways. <laughs> if you Start want to help companies. a lot of people there are other ways to do the, that too yeah. um, and I'm not trying to like put entrepreneurship like on this pedestal it just yeah. means like you're doing this because it's you yeah. like there's something about it, it, you're doing it for you and, and, it's, and not in a selfish sense but just in a like let's get real yep. like this is no, like I it's a scary thing to to be comfortable with and so i think the more that yeah I, i've listened to myself the more i just try to be more of me um you do you yeah That's so awesome claire thanks so much for coming on <laughs> thank you really so much for having me dan amazing conversation i appreciate it cheers Thanks for watching this episode of Escape Velocity. Be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment with your biggest insight from our conversation. Be sure to check out the next episode.